And please welcome James Mwangi, who is going to speak to us now from Africa Climate Ventures. James, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, uh, and thank you to the Climeworks team for the work you're doing and for bringing together this amazing community. Uh, less thank you for, make, for putting together such an intimidating event, coming at the end of really some of the world's experts in just about everything I'm gonna talk about, and standing between those experts and their drinks and relaxation. Not a great place to be, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and do my best. Um, I want to talk about the CDR industry, the carbon dioxide removal industry, and how we make it a global industry. And I want to start with a basic point from first principles. We got into the mess that Catherine just described with a hose that was feeding in, that was built by the most globally integrated marketplace in the world. Fossil fuels, emitting technologies, we moved resources all over the world to the places where they could be used most quickly to deploy. Right? So we don't have most of the emissions where we get our fossil fuels from, for example. They are, the fossil fuels are burnt elsewhere. It stands to reason that the same efficiencies that got us into this mess now need to be leveraged to get us out. We need to make sure that all of humanity is mobilized around the question of growing that dream. So as the name of my organization suggests, I'm very focused on Africa. And usually, when we talk about Africa, we begin with the idea of Africa as the quintessential climate victim. Didn't do much to put that water in the pool, struggling to swim, don't have the resources to swim. So you have a continent that is already on track to lose, to face a headwind of about negative 5% in GDP growth per year from the climate change already locked in. An example of that, until 2019, my country, Kenya, was one of the fastest growing economies in the world. Ran smack dab in addition to the COVID pandemic, which has its climate, uh, some would argue is in part related to climate in terms of human-animal conflict. Um, but in, in addition to the pandemic, we had a four-year drought. That four-year drought has placed a measurable drag on the economy and taken it in some ways off track. Second thing the economies are too small to meaningfully invest in some of the solutions that are needed to, to, to bolster their people. And finally, as you think about how to re-accelerate the economies of places like Africa, we're finding that this part of the world, which had the least to do with the current stock of greenhouse gases, now faces the challenge of having to grow its economies, generate opportunities for its people without leveraging the technologies of the 20th century to do so, because there's simply not the political or the financial support for doing that anymore. So very often, that's where the conversation ends. Africa, climate victim, people feel bad about it. Um, there's a debate about where might we be able to secure some resources to help the people of Africa d deal with their plight. But let's first focus on the bigger problem and the trillions of dollars that need to be deployed to solving the challenge. And I would argue that's a mistake. So the sheer scale of the problem suggests a different role for Africa. Now, we are heading for the stock take. Uh, Marcus talked about it. And I think we can predict a couple of things. We will be reminded that right now, if we're serious about getting to net zero by 2050, by the way, I made sure to take out any actual numbers from my conceptual slides because I realized I'd be presenting them to many of the sources for those numbers, and you never want to have a typo in there. So this is conceptual deliberately. Some countries cannot aim and are not aiming to reach net zero by 2050. They are in the peak of their industrial acceleration. They're talking about dates in the 2060s, 2070s, 2080 even. Some countries have made net zero promises, and I think what the homework that we're getting graded in a few months' time at the stock take is going to show is very few of them are on track to live up to those commitments. That means we have a whole pile of emission, additional emissions beyond what we need by 2050 already on, on deck. Arithmetic, if it works still the way that I was taught in primary school, means that we must be expecting some countries to remove carbon at massive scale over and above their own emissions. To essentially go, I used to say carbon negative, I prefer to say climate positive. 
Now, Africa is the continent that's closest to net zero today. Our per capita emissions are the lowest on the globe. It stands to reason that there's an opportunity there to go in the other direction. Now, this is increasingly recognized, and very often people jump to a legitimate conclusion. There's a huge opportunity in protecting that Africa's natural ecosystems, which are already some of the last remaining protected ecosystems or relatively untouched ecosystems of the world, and perhaps expanding them. So we did some analysis um, looking at, at different carbon prices, what might be possible. And this picture here suggests that, you know, call it between one, at, at $100 a ton, and granted, we just wanted to set it out there, just say, if price was not really an issue, right now we're seeing prices between $10 and $20 a ton, but it wasn't an issue, Africa could probably do something like 1.3 gigatons between protection of existing ecosystems, uh, which accounts for about 750, gigaton, uh, 750 million tons a year, and about 600 million tons a year of removals from actually expanding nature-based solutions. So that's what Africa could do in this space. We should do that. Right? We should create the incentives to do that. That's beginning to pick up momentum in a number of countries. A lot of attention now going to things like what the voluntary carbon markets can do to create the jobs and the opportunities. You can, there's a version of this that shows that this creates something like 140 million jobs just doing this, just caring for and expanding the nature base. Now, not all of these are new jobs. Some of these are livelihood improve, improvements to smallholder farmers uh, and so on but there's a real economic opportunity here, and it's a broad-based economic opportunity. However, it's not the only opportunity. There's a potential for a whole other type of opportunity that builds on Africa's other attributes. And what are those attributes? A superabundance of renewable energy is one. 40%, 40 of the world's terrestrial solar energy hits the African continent. Despite that, only 1.2% of the world's installed base of solar is in Africa, and actually in 2021, the last date for which we have data, only 0.6% of global investment in solar went to Africa. Now, there are a number of investors here. If I told you that you were leaving your best raw resource on the bench while deploying your limited supply of, of photovoltaics and other resources to places with less good solar, you'd say, we're making a mistake. The second thing, limited emissions that renewable energy can be used to displace. This is an important challenge. We've talked about the fact that most of the pathways in DAC will require energy, large amounts of energy. We've also acknowledged that the first priority has to be shutting down existing emissions. And that means that as this industry begins to scale, we're going to run into a logical challenge. Right? And there's no way around it. Where does the marginal unit of energy go? towards powering another DAC plant or towards shutting down the remaining fossil fuel infrastructure. Now, sometimes that choice can be avoided, but in many cases, it really does rule out a lot of the more established economies as places where you can do this at scale without, in some ways, unnecessary trade-offs. We've got large endowments of land and other natural resources, including our subterranean geology, right? Massive continent. The one I'm most excited about is our large and entrepreneurial young workforce. Back in the, in the first picture, Africa is a climate victim. Africa is the youngest continent. 2.5 billion people, a quarter of the world's population, will live in Africa by 2050. Try inspiring those people with a story about how they're the victim of the world's other actions and they are passive in the face of the disaster that's affecting them. That's not a way to motivate anyone. That's a course for disaster. So how do you motivate them? How do you give them a purpose? How do you activate them? And finally, all those people are going to need to live in places. They're going to need to build. Much of Africa's infrastructure has not been built yet. 40% of new urban dwellers in the world between now and 2050 are going to be in Africa. The fastest growing urban environments in the world are going to be in Africa. That's a whole lot of concrete into which you might be able to inject CO2, among other things that you could do. You can build an entire infrastructure, which is already starting to be built along new principles. Let's not repeat the mistakes of the 20th century. Now, in all of this, the one that I always come back to is the young workforce. Uh, Jason Hockman of the DAC Coalition has been great at pulling together, helping us pull together and connect 
people in Africa, in Kenya, and other countries that are concerned about climate change and want to engage in climate action into the broader DAC community. And he made an interesting point, and I'm attributing it to him in case it doesn't land. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, we talk about Ma Malcolm Gladwell, as uh, you, you may have heard, you know, makes the point that one of the, if you wanted to be a landmark corporate lawyer, the best place and time to be born was a garment district in New York in the 1930s at the takeoff of corporate law, takeoff of corporate finance. Uh, that put you in the right place. If you wanted to be one of the titans of the technology industry, you could do worse than to be born on the west coast of the United, United States in the mid-1950s. There's an argument that says, given these resources, to be a young person born around, 90, uh, around the year 2000 in places like the East African Rift positions you really well to be one of the titans of that trillion dollar industry by 2050. And that's the vision we're going after. So let me give some tangible examples of what this potential looks like. Um, this is Kenya, home, yeah. Um, on one level, you have Lake Naivasha, or Karia, the center of the Kenya's geothermal industry. Um, similar place to Iceland in many ways, about 900 megawatts of electricity produced there. They're adding 100 megawatts every year. The reason they're not adding more, there's 10 gigawatts of potential, is there's no demand. No demand even for the 10 gigawatts of pure geothermal. We haven't touched on the world's best wind and some of the best solar. We'll come back to that in a moment. Naivasha is an industrial town. It's a growing town. There's lots of young people coming there with various skills, various technical attributes, looking for jobs. You go further north, Lake Turkana, the world's largest alkaline lake. Right next to it, Lake Turkana Wind Farm, the largest wind farm in Africa. It's 300 megawatts, but it could do easily 1.5 gigawatts, and it's next to several others. This is the world's second best performing terrestrial wind farm, period. Right? The second best in the world in terms of its uptime. And the reason it's not expanding, no demand. Literally, we're saying, who needs gigawatts upon gigawatts of renewable energy? We've got it for you, alongside basalts, alongside lots of water, some of it alkaline, that might be useful, um, and alongside a young workforce. So how do we unlock it? Some of that is just bringing the pieces together. You need various industries to show up, expressing demand. Direct air capture is a good one because you're not shipping anything out. Once you've installed the capacity, um, it's there and you're just monetizing it. But there are others as well, green ammonia, the whole hydrogen economy, a whole range of other energy-hungry industries. So this is the shore of Lake Turkana. Sparsely populated, really, really needs the investment and has the potential to be one of the major renewable hubs of the planet, re renewable energy hubs of the planet but it needs to be unlocked. And that's the work that Great Carbon Valley, a company that we're backing, is getting into, is how do we make sure that the storage, the mineralization capacity is in locations like Lake Trukana and Naivasha, that we bring together the energy providers, that we bring together players in DAC and other climate smart technologies to do something at scale and do it quickly, not just for the planet, but to also transform this economy and to realize a vision of global decarbonization and climate positive growth. And climate positive growth is a real possibility for Africa. If we look at the traditional picture right here of what economic growth has typically looked like, you look at countries by GDP and emissions per capita, all of Africa is clustered as close to zero and zero as you can get. The traditional path has been you grow your emissions and then you grow your economy. That's not going to be available to Africa. Africa is going to need to do three things. The first one is embrace low emissions production and consumption for its own needs. Leapfrog to e-mobility, leapfrog to green agriculture, and so on and so forth. 2.5 billion people, they cannot increase their emissions footprint the way that the rest of the world did, otherwise we are locked into disaster. The second thing Africa can do is be a hub for emissions intense industries or energy intense industries that could use those terawatts literal terawatts of renewable energy and raw materials that the continent has to offer. And the third thing is it can go past the zero line and build a massive industry, be the home of that trillion dollar industry that is carbon removal, and thus grow its economy while actually increasing the global carbon budget. No one has ever managed that. Someone is going to have to if we're going to make it to net zero by 2050. So, the obvious questions, typically, when I'm out here talking about Africa doing this and that, folks will say, 
well, but are the governments engaged in this? Do people understand this? Interestingly, you're starting to see policymakers on the continent understand that this is their shot. For decades, the challenge has been how do you break out of a set of poverty traps that are really difficult to break out of? And people are realizing that Africa, by virtue of missing out on a lot of 20th century style investment and growth, is actually uniquely positioned to be a winner in climate sensitive and climate smart 21st century development. So there are new policies and regulations that align with Kenya's climate centric growth agenda that, the, that, that, that our president has adopted. There's a national carbon removal roadmap. Kenya is one of the very few countries that's actually saying, what's our policy around creating a space for this industry across engineered and nature-based methods? How do we make this a real hub for this type of work? There's a commitment to taking our grid, which is currently 92% renewable, to 100% renewable by 2030 and growing it from three gigawatts, nothing to write home about, to 100 gigawatts by 2040. The resource is there, it's mapped. The question is, can we find the demand that attracts the investment? And then finally, how do we move this narrative? How do we move the thinking of folks from Africa as a climate victim to potentially the key to achieving a climate positive future for the planet? And that's the basis for the Climate Action Summit that's planned for September 4th to the 6th. It's a gathering, yes, focused on Africa, but in a different way. The goal is to make the case, here are the ways that Africa can, in addition to deserving investment and support by virtue of having not caused this, is actually a place you should invest in proactively because it offers some of the best returns as a, as a place for proactive solutions. And we're hoping to start to bring together a different kind of climate community of innovators, investors, and actors to come to Kenya, understand the continent's potential, and begin to think about where we might be able to deploy and execute. Hope to see you there. And as we say in Kenya, asanteni sana. That's thank you very much for your patience. And uh, see you in Nairobi in September. Thank you.